Prime at the top. I'm going to use this version right there to compute U2. So U2 is antiderivative U2 prime. So it looks like a U substitution is what we should be doing on this antiderivative right here. Because if U, well, for, what's a reasonable choice for U or V? E to the negative X. So E to the negative X. So it's already on the board right there. I'm not going to rewrite, I'm not going to duplicate that V substitution. We have a slight problem though. That term E negative 2X is not DV. So we're going to have a slight problem here. How can I rewrite this term? So I can write it as e to the negative x times e to the negative x. Then one of them will be part of the dv, and the other one will be a regular v. So we're going to split it like this. I need a negative in front of one of them, and then I'll put another negative out front. So this will still be equal, but I'll get my negative e to the negative x. So get sine e negative x dx. So we get negative integral v sine v dv. So any questions on that v substitution right there? How in the world do we integrate this? There's that v out front of the sign. Do some parts. Integration by parts. So I want this V, I want to be taking a derivative of this term, and then the other term doesn't matter if I go derivative or anti, because I'll basically get the same thing. So I'm going to make an integration by parts. Now, of course, I'm using a letter V, so that's always a little bit dangerous. So I'll write int by parts. Integral u dv is equal to integral u v minus integral v du. We're already using the letter v, so let's swap out. I'll just change my v to a w. That should be good enough, so we're going to use integration by parts. So u is v and dw is sine v dv. So regular w is negative cos v and du is dv. There is a negative sign out front of this whole thing. So we're going to get negative everything. So uw is negative v cos v minus integral <coughs> v dw. So that's v. that'll be u dw is sine uh -oh. I think that should be a What's going wrong here? Maybe the integration by part by one? GW. Ooh. I think I need to swap both letters out. Oh, it may be time to go Greek here. All right, let's go Greek because having the same letter names is messing me up. So let's go alpha beta. That looks nothing like u and v. So let's go alpha d beta equals alpha beta minus integral u swap. So it's beta d alpha. So there's integration by parts with alpha betas. And now there hopefully won't be any confusion. Alpha is v and d 
theta is sine b dv. <coughs> so regular beta is negative cos v. d alpha is dv. So now ready to actually make these changes. So alpha beta is negative v cos v minus integral minus cos v dv. What set off my spidey sense earlier is we basically had a v cos v dv and I knew I shouldn't have I was supposed to drop the power of v by one so that was not where I was expect I was expecting to have no variable in front of cosine. So we got v cos v. This is antiderivative of regular cos v, which is sine v. And then that negative I distributed as well. Somewhere we made our v substitution, so we get an unsub v. So this is e to the negative x cos e to the negative x minus sine e negative x. This Would that is. Be able to sine v? I don't think so, because so cosine has three negative sides in front of it, so it's the antiderivative. Oh, the one out front. Okay. Yeah, of negative, so it should be negative. So this is u2, should be linearly independent from u1, looks like it is. Alright, so we can write our final y, I'm just rewriting from up here. So our u1 was negative cos e negative x, y1 was way before y1 e to the x. Plus u2 is way more complicated. E negative x cos e negative x minus sine e negative x. And then this y2 was e to the 2x. Now we're missing constants here. I think we pick one up on the u1 and u2 antiderivatives. You look in a textbook and see which, I'm pretty sure, I need a plus C2 and a plus C1. I did them in that light blue. I'm pretty sure that's where they're going to come in. So your book keeps the constants with a homogeneous solution. All 
All right, let's write the particular solution out. <coughs> so what we were just finding was the particular solution. So we were finding yp right here. So what we just wrote down is yp. Some of this will, uh, can we combine any of this? I think that first term combines with that term right there. So let's distribute. So we get minus e to the x cos e negative x plus, now e to the 2x times e to the negative x is e to the positive x cos e negative x and then minus e to the 2x sine e to the minus x. So that first two terms are going to cancel each other out. So this is our particular solution right here, yp. So any questions on where we got yp? It's at the top of the board is where it came from. It took a long time to get u1 and u2. So now we're going to write the overall uh, solution, which is the homogeneous, the zero solution, plus this particular solution that we just got. So our overall solution, you're going to add the homogeneous, call that yc plus particular solution. So the homogeneous, remember, is constant times uh, e to the mx plus constant times e to the other mx. So our yc will look like b1 e to the 1x, second homogeneous solution, e to the 2x, so we have b2 e to the 2x, plus our particular is right above, negative e to the 2x, sine e to the negative x. So you see the homogeneous and the particular added together. Usually the particular won't collapse down to a single term. That was just really lucky right there. That the cosines happen to add up to zero. That generally won't happen. So we'll do one more example. y double prime plus 4y prime plus 4y equals 3x e to the negative 2x. So first thing you're going to do is solve homogeneous. So that's y double prime plus 4y prime plus 4y equals 0. So solve that right now. I'll give you exactly a minute. So you should have gotten m is negative 2 repeated twice. How do we write our homogeneous solution out? This is incorrect. So we have to bump up the power. When you have a repeated term, you have to put a 
power of x in there. This is only repeated twice, so I have a constant and then a linear, or just the power of x. If it was repeated three times, I'd have another x squared after this. All right, so that is yc, and we're writing y1 and y2. So y1 e negative 2x, y2 x e negative 2x. So I'm just grabbing those two solutions, the homogeneous solutions. And we can write yp is going to be u1 y1 plus u2 y2. I'm taking this from the notes that we already used earlier. We're using the Ronskian, which will be W. I'll write W out over here. It's the determinant of y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. So there's y1 is e to the negative 2x, y2 x e to the negative 2x. I have to take derivatives now. Negative 2 e to the negative 2x. The second, this other derivative is going to need a product rule, so I need a little more space. That's the Ronskian right there. We'll go ahead and finish this determinant off. <coughs> this matrix is a little more complicated. So what I'm gonna do is come through and subdivide it because what I don't wanna do is have this first e to the negative two x somehow get paired up with that term to the left. So you don't want that to happen. Scan is just e to the minus 4x. <coughs> Any questions on that determinant? That simplification was kind of tricky. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to replace column 1 <coughs> with the constant column. Our new constant column, I'll write in blue. So our constant column will go 0, qx over a2. Our a2 in this example was 1. a2 is a leading coefficient. So it would be the invisible 1 in front of y double prime. So that's our a2, and then our qx just e, uh, 3x e to negative 2x. So that column is going to get swapped out, the one we just wrote in blue right there. Second column is the same second column we had before. 
x e negative 2x and e negative 2x minus 2x e minus 2x so w is just e to the minus 4x we already computed that now <coughs> and that's a reciprocal because we're dividing by that now the determinant we get 0 which is nice minus 3x squared e to the negative 4x so our e to the negative 4x's cancel out and u1 prime is going to be negative 3x squared so regular u1 is the antiderivative negative 3x squared dx just negative x cubed. So any questions on the u1 steps right there? I know there's a lot to keep track of. That constant column went in right there with that, in that blue box. So you are going to compute u2. And I'll start out with the u2 prime what you need to do is swap out the second column so the first column is e negative 2x Ne negative 2 e to the negative 2 x. All right, so I want you to swap in that constant, the new constant column right there, and compute that determinant. It should be pretty straightforward. It'll still have one zero in it, so it'll still be a nicer determinant. Mm -hmm. can go back and watch it a second time if you want to actually see where it came from or just use what's at the bottom basically. It's up to you. get just 3x 
for your YouTube Prime. Any questions on the determinant? All right, we're finding U2. So that's the antiderivative of U2 prime. So we get three halves x squared. So that is U2. <coughs> Somewhere around here we wrote down, you no, know, maybe we didn't write down for this problem. So in the last problem, I wrote down yp is <coughs> u1 y1 plus u2 y2. So we finally have our u1, so it's negative x cubed. y1, well, they're both, well, it's important, they're not the same. y1 was e to the negative 2x. Y, or u2 was 3 halves x squared. times x e to the negative 2x. This y2 had an extra x attached to it. So we gotta make sure we bring that down as well. This is the y1, y2 in the upper right corner of the board. I'm just copying them down. So we got 3 halves minus 1, which is 1 half x cubed e negative 2x. So that's our particular right there. How would I know if this was a solution without rechecking every single step I just did and then assuming the process I showed you earlier was also correct? Yep, so take derivative, take second derivative, plug it in for y double prime, y prime, and regular y. Now that's not the homogeneous solution, so what we would be solving, uh-oh, is that too far? What we would be solving if I plugged it in is this equation, not the homogeneous version. We just did the homogeneous version to get the m values, basically, the y1 and y2. What we just wrote down a solution to the non-homogeneous, the one at the top. So don't expect to plug it in and get zero. You should expect to plug it in and get this right here. You could try the uh, homogeneous solution, check it, but usually your homogeneous won't have any issues because it's really easy to get. So your homogeneous, if you want to check it, you can usually check it way faster. Uh, if you are going to check your homogeneous, I would check it before I went and got the non-homogeneous because if your homogeneous has some problems, all that work we just did is not going to work out. So homogeneous is a good place to check, make sure you actually have the right solution. So we're actually, instead of doing a higher order problem, let's just go right to reduction of order instead. So this lets us generalize things a little bit. So we're going to start with a non linear ODE. Oh, it could be linear, but it'd be really w overkill to use this method to solve linear. So the difference in this problem is these coefficients F2 and F1 are not going to be constants. So we'll start with the homogeneous version, meaning it equals zero. Almost every time I use homogeneous from now on, it's going to mean equals the ODE equals zero, not that we have special types of coefficient functions. So we have this. If we also know a non-trivial solution,
Just looking at this ODE, what would be the most trivial solution for Y you could think of? You don't have to think that hard. The most trivial zero? Yeah, zero. It only works because there's zero on the right side. If there was one on the right side, that wouldn't work anymore because it would be zero equals one. So homogeneous usually has a solution y equals zero. So we want to uh, start with a non-trivial solution. And so what that's going to mean for us is it's not a constant, or it's not equal to zero, sorry. Non-trivial solution, so we have y1. Non-trivial means it's not zero. So we're not going to be able to do anything with the zero solution. So we need to get a non-trivial solution. Once we have a non-trivial solution, we can do what's called reduction of order to get a second solution. So we're basically going to exploit the first solution to get a second solution out. So that's what we're going to be doing. So you can use reduction of order. find the second solution. It will also produce a particular solution to a non-homogeneous. Non-homogeneous looks almost identical. We got f two y double prime plus f one y prime plus f zero y, but this time on the right we have q of x. And the difference is there's now a q of x on the right side. So we're going to begin by assuming. that the second solution, y2 of x, is equal to our first solution times the integral of some magic function. Now I say magic function because it's some u of x function that's going to have certain properties. of x has the properties so first u2 prime of x is going to be y1 prime of x integral ux dx Y one x u of x so this was just the derivative using the product rule product on y2 so their derivative y1 is y1 prime times the original integral plus derivative of the integral is just ux you just cancel the integral that's y2 prime We can write it without all the of x of x of x of x everywhere. So written without all that, that's y1 prime integral u plus y1 u. So I just wrote, or didn't write any of the of x and <coughs> the dx. So that's the first property. Second property, we'll take a second derivative. taking a derivative of the derivative, there's going to be two product rules we have to deal with here. 
I'm going to write it without all the of x parts. I think it'll be way better than writing of x all over the place. So I'm going to use our final version of the derivative right there. So our first product rule, oops, that's not where the second one goes. So that'll be y1 double prime integral u plus y1 prime antiderivative, or derivative of the antiderivative is just y1 prime u. Plus, now I'm moving to the second term, y1 prime u plus y1 u prime. So there's two middle terms. So that gives us y1 double prime plus two y1 prime u plus y1 u prime. use those two versions that I just earned underlined and we're going to plug into the original. The y1 double prime. Uh, we'll also have the oh yeah, yeah, I just completely didn't write that second part. That'll really screw things up later. <coughs> there we go. Alright, so we're going to plug it into the ODE, which I'll just rewrite right here without all the of x, of x everywhere. So we got f2y double prime plus f1y prime plus f0y equals q of x. Actually, we'll plug into the homogeneous first, so it'll be 0 on the original. Plugging in y2, so I'll just go ahead and write a little y2. That's the version we're going for. So let's rewrite the original y2 just as y1 integral u, so that there's no of x anywhere. So I'm just simplifying all of our notation down as much as possible. So we got f2 times y2 double prime, y1 double prime integral u plus 2y1 prime u plus y1 u prime plus f1 times y1 prime integral u plus y1 u. Remember, all these are multiplication, not function composition. So it looks just like function f2 is eating what's next to it, but it's f2 of x multiplied by this crazy function of x. So we have multiplication going on, not function composition. Last up are f2, or uh, f0 times regular y2, which is y1 integral u, and this stuff all equals 0. Okay. So any questions on that Substitution should just be getting kind of complicated, but we're just substituting in all this stuff right here. We're going to regroup by basically the u term. So there's antiderivative of u terms, there's just regular u terms, and there's u prime terms. So we're going to group up basically by derivatives of u. So let's get all the integral of u terms first. So anything that's integral of u, we're going to write first. And we're also going to be distributing all these functions out. So we'll go with integral of u first. So I have one term in the first, which is f2y1 double prime. The second term, I have f1y1 prime. The third term, I have f0, y1. And I factored the integral of u out. Now I'm going for regular u terms. So I have f2, or 2 f2, y1 prime. And 
y1 f1 and for u prime terms there should only be one and it's going to be f2 u prime f2 y1 Why does what I just crossed out equal zero? So you just look up a tiny bit on the board, two lines up. And that's basically we re regrouped, so we're looking at the original ODE right there. And we assume we assume that Y1 was a homogeneous solution, not a particular solution. So Homogeneous solution means if you plug it in here, you get it equal zero. So that's the fact that we're using right there. So equal zero because y1 is homogeneous solution. All right, well, that makes our life a lot easier. We just leave that term out and rewrite everything else. I'm going to put the y prime term in the about to do some more things to this. Yeah, I'll just write the y, the y1 term in the front. So I'll write it as f2y1 u prime plus 2 f2y1 prime plus f1y1 u equals 0. We're going to multiply by a term now, multiply the entire equation by dx over u f 2y1. It won't make sense why we're doing this, we're just going to do it. And then the result will be a lot nicer. So we're going to multiply it all the way through here. How do I rewrite u1 prime with the, it's d what over d what? So I want to rewrite u prime as d what over d, so it'd be du over dx. So that's what I'm replacing u1, or u prime by. So it's du over dx. So I'm just changing notation right here. We're going to do the same thing for y1 prime right here. This is dy1 over dx. So we're going to do the same thing for that. Because what we're about to do is basically do some algebra with derivative notation. So we're going to be distributing through, so it's going to cancel out some of those dx's as we distribute. There's really three terms that we have to distribute to. One, two, three, because there's a sum right there. So here we go. We're going to get a huge amount of cancellation on the first term. I believe we get 1 over u du because f2y1 cancels, dx dx cancels, and you're just left with du over u. All right, next up, f2s are going to cancel, dx is going to cancel. We still have the 2. One over u, just dy one. Oh, yeah, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, I missed that u on the far right. That'll cancel. There's a y one in the denominator. I think that's what we get. 
So X goes away, F2 goes away, U goes away. And our last term, the U's are going to cancel. We, we get both F's this time, so it'll be F1 over F2. So the U's are gone. The Y1's cancel DX. So I'm just going to double check on my nose so we're in the right spot. Alright, so things are looking good. So it's a little bit weird that we have three variables right now. However, this is separable. It's already separated. So f1 and f2 are functions of x. They're next to dx. The du and the dy1 integrals are trivial. They're both natural logs. So they're super easy to do. So we actually have a separable and three unknowns, or three variables. And all we have to do is take an antiderivative. Uh, I'm going to bring the dx term to the other side. And then integrate the whole thing. So we get ln u plus 2 ln y1 equals whatever in the world. Completely depends on f1 and f2, but whatever this uh, f1 over f2 antiderivative is. What in the world are we trying to solve for? So it's not f1 and f2. That was in our original ODE. We're trying to solve for f1 and f2. So it's either y1 or u. Let's look back at our assumptions. So we assumed y1 was a non-trivial solution that we just got for free. So we're not trying to solve for y1. We're trying to solve for u, which is somewhere down here. So we're trying to find this ux with these properties. So we're trying to solve for u. So I see addition outside of a natural log is multiplication inside. So this gives us ln of u times y1 squared. That 2 ln y1, you just move the 2 in as a power. And now ln inverse, both sides. And then divide by y1 squared. So there we go, that is u. I'm going to go back up for a minute. We should have written how u relates to uh, y2. And if not, we'll write it down. There we go. So I'm using that at the top of the board. y2 is y1 times antiderivative of u. So that's our last step. So y2 is y1 antiderivative of u. It'll feel very much like what we did last section where we figured out u1 prime, u2 prime, and then took the antiderivative multiplied by y. So it's a really similar process to what we did last time, but the steps you take in between are quite a bit different. So that'll be our u2, or y2. Uh, and then <coughs> we have our particular, just like before, Thank you. 
So we did just find the, so this Y2 would be the particular, not the homogeneous. I think it'll just be Y2, but I'm not sure. Let's just go ahead and let's just get down to Y2 on our first example, and then I'll figure out what, how that fits back in. Oh, time to stop. All right, we'll pick this up tomorrow. <laughs>